Well, I'm ready, but this is illusion. This is not complete. Welcome back. So um, it's a pleasure to introduce Alina Witnova uh, from University of Warwick. And uh, if you consider uh, the estimates of Hauser they mentioned from the previous talk as uh, about one hour old, Paulina is going to talk about new approach to computing the Hausdorff dimension. Okay, um, let me start by thanking the organizers to inviting me here. It's always a pleasure. You have to turn something on, okay. Okay, let me try it again. Um, let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me here. It's always a pleasure to give a talk in person. I have been missing it uh, for a uh, long two years. And uh, today I decided to slightly uh, change uh, the content of the talk without changing the title after some conversations uh, with uh, participants and um, uh, yesterday and during the last few days. Um, Okay, so what is going on um, a bit today? So in principle, um, okay, in principle, I would like it to work. Um, okay, so pointer is not working now. Um, okay, how can I change uh, the slides? Yeah, well, it doesn't work at the moment. I just cannot change the slides again. Uh, okay, so here's my mouse. Okay, sorry, okay. Um, fine, so uh, the main uh, topic um, for this talk is going to be a new approach for computing um, the spectral radius, the spectral radius of uh, the transfer apparatus. And using this new approach, which we uh, discovered uh, about uh, two years ago, uh, we managed to do the following things. So uh, first, uh, in a setting of one dimensional maps, we uh, managed to compute uh, Laponov exponents. And in a setting of uh, uh, random matrix products, we also managed to compute uh, the Laponov exponents in the setting of um, do their sets we just beginners and in particular uh, I have been asking people uh, for the past few months so what questions are interesting here and in a setting of how I'm moving my mouse all the time um, okay and the setting and finally uh, this is a project which uh, for some reason I find very really dear to my heart it's a computation of the house of dimension of um, an Apollonian circle pattern, which is a partial case of um, uh, special Julia set or just um, parabolic limit set, if you like to think about it. So this is uh, what we did uh, with the new method uh, so far uh, in terms of uh, computing the, uh, in terms of following geometric properties of some sets. Um, uh, but uh, there is some more uh, on the, uh, side of the number theory, which I'm not going to discuss today. And uh, so first I would like to uh, show you what we actually can do, uh, or at least some of it. And then I will try to explain uh, how we do it. So what can we do? Uh, well, I, let me just start, start by recalling what actually these mysterious quantities that we are interested in are. So assume that you have a simple expanding map just of the interval, and then you can define a quantity which is uh, called a metric entropy. And this is a formula for it. It is defined as the integral of the logarithm of the derivative with respect to the measure. And um, in this particular setting, it is the same thing as the Laponov exponent of uh, this uh, expanding map. Um, so in some cases, of course, uh, in very simple setting, uh, you know what this number is exactly, and you don't really need to compute it. For example, if you have a Dublin map and the exponent is just uh, logarithm two, or if you have the Gauss map, then you also know it exactly, um, and it is uh, this number. Uh, furthermore, uh, it is not on this slide, but uh, there is a, a very interesting uh, 
new paper, or recent paper by uh, Julia Sipanchuk and Oscar Banklo, uh, where they also compute uh, these things for the Blaschke products. Uh, apparently, you can do it exactly in uh, the setting of Blaschke products. Also, these maps are not so simple. Uh, okay, uh, so let's start uh, easy. And uh, this is a simple perturbation of uh, the Dublin map. Uh, what is it? It is a code of so called Lanford map. And I believe it appeared in uh, the paper of Oscar Lanford, where he started to model some uh, system coming from uh, biology. And this is what it is. So you just take a Dublin map and you change it slightly. Uh, and well, it's weapon of exponent, uh, we know very good. You may ask why would you particularly want to know uh, 125 digits of this number? Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, in the uh, 17th century, Newton was computing 15 digits of pi, and he also didn't know why he actually doing it. Uh, so well, now we all know why would we want to know 15 digits of pi? Uh, so maybe one day, uh, there will be some use of these numbers as well. Uh, and we don't know yet what it is. Um, and uh, this is the previous result by Caroline Ormel uh, some three years ago. Uh, the difference here is uh, basically the method or as you may call it computational complexity. So uh, Caroline uh, was running the computations on the some uh, complex cluster and it took, uh, uh, I believe, uh, uh, a few days. Uh, so this thing you can do on a couple of uh, minutes on a personal computer or on a simple MacBook Air. So this uh, method is probably much more efficient if you're thinking about uh, time you need to do it. Um, Okay, so that, uh, this uh, parameter, we don't have to choose particularly uh, parameter lambda to be equal to a half. You can consider the entire range of uh, the parameter values. And then if you try to do the same computation, uh, you will see that something is not going to, is not right uh, when uh, you approach uh, parameter equal to one. So uh, what does we see here? So we see here a curve, which is a Lapin, estimates on Lapin of exponent uh, from uh, below and from the top. The solid line is uh, from the top, uh, dashed line is from below. And for the large part of the interval of parameter values, they probably just the same. You cannot usually distinguish between them. Uh, but as the parameter approaches one, uh, they go uh, apart. And uh, one way wonder why is this actually happening? Uh, the reason is that the computation is, the method is not good enough uh, when uh, the map is losing hyperbolicity. So when lambda is approaching one, there is a fixed point where the derivative is equal to one. Uh, so it's parabolic fixed point and this uh, parabolic point and this uh, creates uh, actually a lot of difficulties which you have to uh, do something about. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, one simple family is uh, all right. Uh, how about we do something more complicated? So I was looking um, uh, for some examples and uh, around. And uh, one of the examples, you can always get inspiration from the papers of physicists. Uh, so this I picked up from the work of Gary Froland, and uh, uh, where he uses apparently Ulm's method uh, to and gives heuristic estimate uh, on uh, this uh, on the metric entropy, uh, which is uh, this one. Uh, so uh, now we can recover it without any difficulty and do even more. We can get uh, 15 digits uh, also in a few minutes. Um, okay, so this is what we can do about uh, one dimensional maps. Uh, let's, let's get uh, something uh, somewhere which is probably uh, more interesting. 
Um, so this is a topic of uh, random matrix products. And um, uh, what is the setting here? So we start with a collection of uh, matrices uh, that have to be quadratic uh, non-degenerate matrices and the probability vector, uh, which has been the same dimension as the number of matrices. And uh, what we do about it, uh, we define a quantity which is called the Lyapunov exponent. Uh, so it is a limit of this uh, average. And the thing that you have to watch for when you give this definition is that the new maps you have uh, to, you take a norm of the product. It doesn't this quantity doesn't depend on the norm. Uh, you take the norm of the product, but the way you write the product, the new terms are coming at the end, not in the beginning. Otherwise, there is no convergence. So there's, there's no mistake. There's the last the index, the last index is uh, should be at the end. Do you see my mouse? Oh, yes, you can see. Okay. Um, so this quantity is. Uh, uh, place uh, some role in some applications. Uh, so uh, one thing that you can try, well, this is again became probably a classical example is a setting of uh, two positive matrices uh, with, the, with the probability vector half a half. And uh, in this setting, what you can do, uh, you can do, um, you can, we can, you can uh, compute the Lyapunov exponent uh, with the uh, some again a large number of digits. Um, also, not because we're particularly uh, interested in, just because we could. Um, okay. Uh, so actually, a much more interesting setting is not the setting of uh, positive matrices. A much more interesting setting is the setting of the matrices which are not positive. And uh, one of the particular source of examples. Uh, which will be uh, probably familiar to some in this audience, uh, coming from uh, the so-called surface groups and so of the generators of the surface groups. So what do we see here? Uh, on this particular picture, you see a hyperbolic upper half plane, and you see a regular octagon in this uh, hyperbolic upper half plane. Uh, it's all sides are the same. Uh, so we are in hyperbolic planes. That's why the sides, the uh, sides are not straight lines. They are uh, parts of the circles, the circle arcs, and all the angles are equal pi over four. And what we can do with this regular octagon, uh, we can define the mappings which are identified uh, here the opposite sides of it. So you can define an isometry of the hyperbolic plane, which maps, for example, the lower part here, which is a bit with uh, magenta, and it maps it up and grew it up here. This is will be linear fractional transformation, which just identifies the, open, the sides of this regular octagon. And you can have eight uh, transformations uh, in fact, you have four, and the others are inverses of the first four. And uh, one can consider the group uh, generated by these uh, four transformations, which identify the sites, or the collection of matrices, uh, which, which constitutes this group. Um, so, um, you're particularly interested. <coughs> and, uh, the, so, and if you consider this factor space of the hyperbolic plane with respect to this group, you get a, a Riemann surface of genus two, it is double donut. Um, and its surface also uh, appears in uh, some interest in some uh, quantum physics works, I believe. So initially this uh, type of questions are uh, also coming from mathematical physics. And, um, what we can do, we can uh, consider the Lyapunov exponent uh, of uh, this uh, of a system of uh, four matrices. And what we get here, um, we get uh, an estimate from the top of the below, uh, the double of the Lyapunov exponent. You, have it, you see that in this particular case, we have much smaller number of uh, digits. So our accuracy here is uh, only uh, uh, two digits past one, 
And so for some reason, I couldn't push uh, Hirza. For some mathematical reason, I believe I couldn't push Hirza. Um, OK. So uh, another case, uh, you can do something quite similar, but instead, uh, with the same octagon, yes? OK. Um, so with the, with the same octagon, you don't have to glue the opposite sides. You can actually glue the alternative sides. And this is called so called the uh, standard uh, identification of uh, the sides of uh, the fundamental domain uh, of uh, Riemann surface. And um, then uh, it will be the different system of four matrices. Uh, so again, uh, here H matrix is just uh, isometry of the hyperbolic plane, which I just identifies the sides, uh, but not uh, the opposite sides of the regular octagon, just alternative sides of the regular octagon. So we can glue this pink thing to the pink thing above, then we probably glue this black side to the black side over here. And this gives us uh, another collection of matrices and uh, we can also uh, do the same. We can compute a, a Lyapunov exponent of this random matrix product, which they found as um, taken with equal probabilities. Um, okay, uh, so uh, apparently uh, the Lyapunov exponent is going to be the same. So, in fact, uh, there are different side identifications for the regular octagon, and uh, there are another two, which I'm not going to just present here. Uh, but the Lapunov exponent is independent of the identification of the sites. Um, and whatever you system you get, it's always be the same value. And uh, not because, just not the estimate is the same, the actual value doesn't depend on the site identification. Okay, so this is a conference on Julia sets. So Julia sets are bound to appear. Um, and but as I said, we are just very in the very beginning. Uh, so I have an office mate uh, who joined us uh, uh, in about a year ago, so from September, and it is uh, Julia Slipanchuk, and uh, she was also interested in this type of questions, so I thought we have to do something together. And, uh, and, and this is, uh, that we started uh, with a simple experiment, so what we did uh, is sort of, okay, um, we have uh, this method that uh, uh, enhance. Uh, why don't we try it uh, to uh, get the house of dimension of a Julia set? And uh, we, we see the just simple, small, very small piece in a parameter plane. So that uh, here you see that um, imaginary part is uh, changing from uh, uh, is, uh, zero to 0 0.14. And the real part is just uh, uh, from, uh, minus one fifth to one fifth. And this is a plot of uh, the house of dimension or as a counterplot of the house of dimension as one expect. I, when C see zero, we actually get one. And then it slowly grows uh, the scale on the right shows. So uh, apparently in the right top corner, it is about 1.030 uh, and um, uh, this stopped uh, here not because uh, uh, we couldn't push further, so it is just in the very center of the Monday broad set. Simply stopped here just because we didn't know actually uh, what the good questions are and where we want to go from here. Um, okay. And uh, this is another type of questions again. Uh, so this picture I borrowed from the wonderful paper of uh, Mogin and Mario Shulbansky. Uh, and they study um, another thing. Uh, they study Apollonian circle packing. And um, the way they define it here is written also on the slides. So you take, uh, so this X is entire unit disk, which is uh, here on the paper. Uh, so you take uh, this unit disk and so take the first map, which maps it uh, to the uh, right. Um, Large, uh, the largest disk on the right. As then, um, you, if you add a couple of rotations, you get another uh, two disks. If you take composition with rotation, and then you take 
uh, uh, the limit set of the iterated function scheme generated by these three maps. And uh, believe you or not, uh, this is going to be uh, Apollonian circle pattern. So um, there was a large uh, number of results on this. So the first, uh, I believe, uh, was due to Boyd uh, from 1982. And uh, then uh, Thomas Rivard got a heuristic estimate, uh, which is so uh, apparently uh, seven, eight decimal places. Uh, there is also a famous result uh, by McFullen from 1998. And uh, uh, more recently, uh, Roberto De Leo uh, tried to get also get uh, this estimate, but as far as I believe, uh, none of this is actually uh, rigorous. So what we wanted to do uh, that uh, we wanted to have a completely uh, rigorous estimate for this uh, particular Julia set. Uh, why? Well, because it is very famous, and it is, I think it is a shame that uh, we don't have uh, a concern. Uh, we don't have any good results on it. So, and uh, so far, uh, Caroline Wormel and myself, um, we did, uh, uh, we got the first six digits. We are trying to push forward, uh, but it is uh, still very much in progress. Uh, so this is about it on uh, the type of results that we are getting so far. And uh, now I'm going to uh, discuss uh, the methods that we are using here and actually what is uh, happening. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, there is uh, usually a big difference between uh, uh, what can you do theoretically and what uh, the theory tells you and uh, what actually uh, possible in practice. And uh, as we see that uh, probably uh, the theoretical results in all these cases would have been the same, but uh, when you try to implement it and to get actually uh, the numbers from a computer, uh, the things are coming up uh, very differently. So um, uh, we would like to have a method uh, which where the theory and practice would be somewhat closer together in the sense that if uh, uh, if computer tells me uh, that uh, the theories or the, the, num the estimates I get converge, then uh, I can actually prove it rigorously that this that they converge to the right number. And um, I also would like to have uh, a method that if I if heuristics uh, uh, that there is a theoretical result which tells me that uh, certain uh, should be the result that they should be able to uh, implement it. Uh, the main complication in the last part is coming from the fact that uh, there are always implied constants which can be very large. So in principle, you can have a series which should converge super exponentially, but unfortunately the implied constants are so large that in order to get super, to get to the area, but to the part where actually it converges, Started to converge super exponentially at a reasonable speed, uh, you, you cannot do it. You have to spend uh, more than 10 years uh, waiting before you actually start to get the conversions. And uh, this is not good enough for me. So I want to, uh, both things uh, to agree uh, in some way. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, what we did eventually, uh, eventually uh, I'm going to present our method in a simplest possible setting in hopes that uh, it will be understandable. And then uh, maybe with uh, some audience participation, uh, there will be some uh, more interesting uh, questions or more interesting results or uh, something that we can uh, do. Um, all right. So let's start from the very beginning uh, where it's all started. And uh, it started probably with, uh, in, uh, with thermodynamic formalism and a famous function, which is called the pressure function. Um, and in the setting of an expanded Markov map, it is, uh, you know that there is always a unique ergodic invariant measure. 
and uh, uh, we can uh, define uh, the derivative. Uh, sorry, and we can define uh, the pressure function uh, using this uh, formula by taking the averages of the logarithms of the iterates and by taking the, the sums over all periodic points. Uh, so, and this turns out to be uh, an analytic function, even though uh, it is defined by this uh, it, scary looking formula. And this, oh, the most important part for it is that it is uh, monotone diffusion. It is also convex and it uh, vanishes at zero. And uh, its derivative at uh, zero actually gives us the quantity that we want. Namely, it gives us a metric entropy. And in this particular case, the entropy is the same as the Lapon of its one. Sorry, its derivative at one gives us metric entropy. Um, and it is the level of exponent that we wanted. Um, and this is, uh, uh, in order, it tells us that if you want to estimate uh, the level of exponent, uh, what you can actually hunt for is going to be the derivative of the pressure function. Uh, fortunately for us, um, uh, fortunately for us, due to the convexity, uh, and when that is here, uh, you can bound the derivative of the pressure function uh, just by this simple inequality that it tells you that derivative is going to be somewhere uh, between uh, these two ratios. Uh, there is nothing surprising, probably an exercise in first year calculus. And uh, just uh, be careful, you have to pay attention that there is a minus sign, otherwise, uh, you will get uh, something interesting but very wrong. Um, and uh, there is a thermodynamic technique to estimate uh, the values of the pressure function quite accurately. And uh, the way to do it is uh, why the transfer operators. Uh, so one more time, if you want to estimate uh, the level of exponent, all you're interested in is uh, the derivative of the pressure function. And if you want to estimate the derivative of the pressure function, due to its properties, you just need uh, two values uh, nearby. Mm. Um, okay. Uh, so the gateway to the uh, pressure function is just uh, the transfer of the thermodynamic formalism technique due to transfer operators. So, and uh, in particular, if you uh, have a dynamical system, you can always uh, define or formulate the transfer operator uh, acting on uh, the associated space. For example, in this setting, you can define it acting on uh, the analytic maps, it is sufficient. And uh, results from uh, well now probably very classical tells us that the spectral radius of this linear operator, which is acting on the space of analytic functions, is actually exponential of the pressure, and uh, it is the isolated maximal eigenvalue. Uh, this is very important to us. And uh, moreover, if you have any positive function and you start iterating it then under the iterations of the transfer operator, the positive function is actually going to converge. Uh, the norm of the positive function is actually going to converge to the factor radius. So this is a kind of thing which is very similar to the power method for the matrices. If you have a largest isolated matrix, a largest isolated eigenvalue of a matrix and um, uh, the matrix has relatively good spectral properties, then uh, you pick up a, uh, a vector and you start iterating it. And after a normalization, you're actually going to converge uh, to this uh, largest eigenvalue. So this is the same type of result. Um, okay, uh, so um, if you want to estimate the uh, uh, pressure, all you want to do is to estimate uh, the spectral radius of the transfer operator. And uh, this is uh, uh, of this idea uh, was based on famous uh, Jenkinson Polyquad paper uh, from 2002, uh, where they developed uh, a big theory uh, approach to this, uh, which is based on the 
uh, zeta functions. Or more precisely, the idea was that uh, you define an analytic function in two variables, and you are looking uh, to uh, for its largest zero. Um, but and you can see that uh, the largest zero of this function is exactly going to correspond to the uh, eigenvalue of the transfer operator. And it is called periodic point method uh, because this analytic function can be written in terms of the periodic points in, in a power series where all the coefficients are uh, written, expressed in the terms of periodic points um, of uh, the map. The difficulty here is that if you have this uh, periodic, if, uh, the, uh, the power series indeed converges uh, super exponentially fast, but as I mentioned earlier, that the implied constants in this power series can be very large. And uh, a, a, a number of periodic points that naturally grows exponentially. So you have to get uh, exponentially increasing amount of data in order to uh, get actually the numbers that you want. And all this is uh, just uh, for a one number, uh, which is uh, actually uh, way too much. So uh, we don't go down this route. And uh, that's uh, instead of this, uh, we are using uh, another approach. And our idea is instead of, if you want to get the eigenvalue, uh, what you can try to get instead, uh, you can try to get the eigenfunction. So our uh, eigenvector or eigenfunction in this case is indeed going to be an analytic function um, on a unit interval. And the space of analytic functions um, actually infinite dimensional and it is not particularly clear how can one get an eigenfunction uh, from a computer because computer can only deal with a finite amount of data uh, but uh, fortunately uh, people have been dealing with these problems namely uh, computing eigenfunctions or uh, of uh, linear operators for many, many years, and if you turn to any engineer, uh, he will probably, or applied mathematician, he will throw a large variety of methods uh, for you to do, uh, to study. So uh, this particular approach, I actually, uh, the particular approach that <coughs> I'm going to discuss now, I actually learned uh, from uh, an old work of uh, Babianko and Yuriev, uh, where they computed uh, the eigenfunction of uh, the Dublin map of, of, uh, of the uh, Tudanovich equation. So they actually, uh, so we all know that there is an old result uh, by Lanford who proved that uh, hyperbolic map of, that hy uh, there exists a fixed point of uh, uh, the Tudanovich equation, which gives as a uh, uh, solution to uh, uh, well, play some important role in uh, one-dimensional dynamics, uh, but actually at the same time, approximately, there was uh, another result, a similar result uh, by Babianka and Yuriev, who were on the other side of the Iron Curtain, and they developed uh, another approach to the study of this uh, Dublin operator, and uh, their convergence, the convergence rate in their method is much, much faster. And this is where uh, I picked up uh, my ideas uh, at first place. So <clears throat> a slight complication uh, here is that uh, in the case of expanding maps, uh, the map that you are hunting for, the eigenfunction is analytic, but in a case, for example, of uh, uh, random matrix products, especially if the matrices are not all positive, uh, the map is not going to be, eigenfunction is not going to be analytic at all. And the best you can hope for, I believe, is that it is Hölder continuous and recovering Hölder continuous functions uh, is not so easy, but uh, still possible probably with uh, a bit more recent techniques. Mm. All right. 
So uh, in order to estimate uh, the spectral, we are hunting for the spectral radius of our transfer operator. And uh, this uh, we can do, uh, fortunately, this is a very simple uh, result. Uh, namely, uh, we just show that if you find just one function, any function, uh, it doesn't, have, it says here positive polynomial because positive polynomials are easier to construct and they're very analytic, uh, but instead absolutely uh, any positive function will do. Uh, so the brackets probably uh, wrong place. It should be polynomials in bracket, not positive in bracket, uh, <clears throat> which satisfies this inequality, uh, then the spectral rate, the, uh, the number on the right that you are getting, whatever number comes from uh, uh, this estimate, uh, it is actually an upper bound on the spectral radius of the transfer operator. And uh, this uh, uh, turns to be, uh, it's very easy colorally of uh, the Royals result. And it probably turns to be sufficient for our purposes in the sense that uh, what we get that if you can find two functions, uh, one is estimating um, uh, one suits to the parameter value one plus epsilon, and another one fits to the parameter value one minus epsilon, and you can get two uh, bounds. One is going to be uh, smaller than one, and another one is going to be uh, bigger than one if you do the things correctly, uh, then uh, the numbers that you want, namely the metric entropy, is uh, 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 bounded uh, from two sides by the logarithm. So these two values divided by epsilon. And this is just direct corollary of, uh, uh, from the properties of, um, uh, well, this is exactly direct corollary from the Lermite bath, but it's actually the principle it follows from the properties of the pressure function and the real stair. So um, where we are now, uh, we are now just to recap uh, that if you want to show that uh, you have uh, uh, metric entropy bounded by these two numbers, uh, then all you need is that you want to find uh, two functions uh, such that uh, one is increasing under the action of the operator Another one is, is going down, is getting small under the action of the operator. And you want to be able to estimate uh, these ratios as accurately as possible. The better bounds you get, uh, the better estimates you have. And um, the difficulty, what remains uh, for us is uh, to find uh, such two functions. Okay. Uh, so uh, if you want to do it, you can try an educated guess. You can try to draw it on a piece of paper, uh, but uh, it, <clears throat> it probably uh, will, not be, will not give you very accurate results. So um, you can try something uh, more uh, scientific, which I learned from applied mathematicians, uh, as I mentioned before. Uh, so namely, we just uh, fix some large number of points. Here, large means six. And um, to this uh, number of points, you associate Lagrange polynomials. These are the polynomials um, on the interval, uh, which, uh, have, uh, which are connected uh, to uh, the points that you've chosen, uh, so that each polynomial at each point, it is just chronic of delta. Uh, so, uh, like once again, so we fix some number of points and we define uh, the polynomial, the system of polynomials on the interval as a number of polynomial uh, of degree, the number of points uh, minus, uh, equal to the number of uh, the number of degree of uh, number of polynomials is going to be the number of points minus one, uh, but it's going to be the, if the number of polynomials is equal to the number of points. And uh, this system has a property that uh, at one point uh, it's uh, the polynomial is equal to one, and at all other points uh, the polynomials just vanish. And apparently, this system of polynomials is called uh, Lagrange polynomials. And uh, once you introduce this system of polynomials, uh, you can construct a linear matrix, which is a certain approximation. Uh, of uh, the transfer operator that you have. 
and um, uh, what you, how do you construct this matrix? You just uh, take the transfer operator, you evaluate it at uh, the corresponding at one of the polynomials, uh, you apply it to one of the polynomials, and then you evaluate the result at one of the points. And this gives you M by M matrix. Uh, uh, it is a real matrix, you can compute it exactly if you have, and all you need to know is you need to know the, your maps you are interested in. And once you have a matrix, you can compute the eigenvector of this matrix in this particular setting, you want to compute the left eigenvector. So if your matrix is particularly large, uh, you can use the power method uh, just to recover it. If your uh, matrix is a bit small, then probably there are other ways which are maybe more efficient. Uh, but, the, but anyway, then all you need uh, is just one eigenvector which corresponds to the maximum eigenvalue. And from this eigenvector, you can actually reconstruct the eigenfunction by taking a linear co combination of uh, the Lagrange polynomials with the weights which are coming from the eigenvector. And <laughs> this uh, function uh, can be shown to approximate the true eigenfunction of uh, the linear operator. And it is a, a function that we, are go, that we are in fact uh, using as a test function uh, in a presence inequality. <coughs> uh, so now uh, the previous part is quite easy. Uh, the hard task is here. The hard, the main difficulty is here is that after you found your candidate for the function, you should be able to get upper and lower bounds on uh, the ratio. And uh, it calls it again that we are dealing with the uh, ratio with the functions. We are not dealing with um, some finite thing, but uh, fortunately, particularly in the case of uh, polynomials, um, <coughs> if you think a little bit, um, it, would, it can do it uh, quite well. So um, uh, note that uh, if it is a polynomial uh, uh, and then you can differentiate it very easily. And furthermore, um, uh, what the quantity that you are looking for, uh, the supremum of the ratio is uh, actually, well, just the ratio. Uh, is not going to change much if uh, your function is approximating the eigenfunction because uh, if uh, your function f is approximating the eigenfunction of the operator, then this ratio in fact should be very close to the constant. It doesn't have much uh, anywhere to go. Uh, so and uh, so you are trying to estimate uh, the supremum. You want to get of the some function which is coming as a ratio of two functions, but this function is essentially a constant function. Um, and okay, your space is very large, so well for the purpose, so you cannot actually estimate <coughs> it on every small interval. But what you can do is that you can estimate its derivative instead. Uh, so <coughs> uh, what you want to do. Uh, you want to uh, estimate the derivative of uh, uh, the ratio of uh, these two functions. And because uh, you hope that uh, the function is uh, very close to a constant, you actually hope that the derivative is going to be very small. And uh, this actually makes it possible to estimate the ratio on an entire interval of parameter values, just because um, uh, what you're hunting for is that because the function you're interested in, it doesn't change much. So the key uh, here probably is that uh, uh, what you want to do, uh, you want to estimate uh, the derivative of the ratio, which is supposed to be a very, very small number uh, near zero. And you want to get an upper bound on uh, this uh, derivative uh, as accurately as possible. I want to do it. Okay, uh, so this is uh, uh, our uh, approach in uh, 
a shot. Um, well, one might actually uh, start to wonder uh, why uh, do we want to do this? Um, so can I have uh, another five minutes maybe? So, um, okay, so our motivation uh, here was uh, mainly to uh, study, uh, well, we started with the study of uh, the house of dimension of some limit sets on the interval. Uh, then we proceeded to the study of the Lyapunov exponents. Uh, then we proceeded to the study of uh, the Lyapunov in the case of maps, and then in the case of random matrices. Uh, and so now, uh, well, now we're trying to push to the Julia sets if we find to, to find something uh, good questions for us, and uh, in particular the different types of uh, the careful patterns that also also be very interesting. And um, one of the motivations uh, for to study, for example, the Lyapunov exponents of uh, random matrix products is a study of uh, the harmonic measure. Uh, so <clears throat> this is uh, this I don't. Uh, from uh, one of the particular things, Julia is here. Yotz is here. Oh, okay. I learned it from your paper. Um, okay. Uh, so <laughs> we take, you start uh, with the sequence of, uh, in this case, uh, SO2 matrices. And um, then you pick a point in the hyperbolic plane and apply uh, your matrices in some uh, random order. And if you do things right, then the sequence will converge uh, to the boundary in um, the Euclidean metric uh, when you draw it to the this kind of plane. And so then one can define the measure on the boundary associated to this uh, random product of matrices. And uh, the basically, it, the measure is the of the interval of any moral set is the probability to end up uh, in this set and the iterations of the system of matrices. And uh, the question which comes from uh, Kaimanovich and Lapins, I believe, is that uh, what kind of uh, properties have the limiting measures some, uh, on the boundary? So sometimes it is called harmonic measure, and sometimes it is called the hitting measure, uh, just because the point hits the boundary, I believe. Um, and one way of wonder, uh, whether, for example, this measure that you get in the limit is uh, continuous or uh, whether it is uh, uh, singular with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Um, so there is this large uh, collection of results. Uh, so sometimes it is the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no. Uh, what is not uh, known here is whether it can, so the examples when the measure is uh, continuous are all examples of non discrete groups. So an open question is whether it is possible that there exists a discrete group um, of uh, this matrices so that uh, the, genera the matrices generate actually discrete group and the measure on the boundary, the heat measure on the boundary is uh, uh, not continuous. Uh, so um, it's, it's still continuous. Uh, I believe uh, that the current consensus is that the answer is no. So it would be really interesting if we can find such an example. And one of the ways uh, to approach the question of continuity is that uh, you can study um, the Hausdorff dimension of the actual measure. So I'm not going to give the, the definition of the Hausdorff dimension of a measure, uh, but uh, instead, uh, I'm just going to tell you that what it is. So if you find uh, some particular quantity, uh, which is uh, called random, um, uh, random walk entropy, then uh, the house of dimension can be expressed as a ratio of uh, the random walk entropy and the Lyapunov exponent of the random matrix product. So uh, we know now quite well uh, how we can estimate uh, the Lyapunov exponent. What we don't know yet, or I have not mastered the skill yet, is uh, the estimate of uh, the entropy. Um, and apparently, but there are some results which were sufficient for our purpose. Um, 
the, and in particular, in the case of uh, the Boltzmann surface, which I showed, which coming from the identified the opposite sides of the octagon, uh, we get uh, you know, we get quite accurate estimate on the Hausdorff dimension. In particular, this quite, this confirms that uh, the measure is singular, and uh, in, um, in what's the surface group, uh, you also get another result, which is benefit uh, based uh, on a paper of by uh, Schwartz and his student Peter Kasienka, who we invited uh, to our seminar and to, uh, we were asking him questions for three hours before we understood everything in his paper. Um, and uh, but we thought that uh, the Hausdorff dimension of the measure is so so smaller than one, so the measure must be uh, singular in this case. Um, and I think uh, this is about it. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Polina. Are there any questions? Yeah, thanks for the nice. <laughs> So this is not an interesting method. Uh, question to go. So for the interval maps, if if it's expanding, I can see that yeah. the Rolf Rubinus operator will converge nicely to, yeah. to the eigenvector. Yeah. But for instance, if you look at uh, random matrix products, these maps are not expanding everywhere, right? Yes. So, uh, but so so, but you're saying that this still works in, in this well, case. So what yes. what 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 happens there? So what happens there is that we get con we get contraction on average. There is an old result uh, by Lapage from 1972, uh, which tells us that uh, if uh, the system of uh, if the induced maps on the unit circle in particular are contracting on average, uh, then uh, uh, then you have an isolated maximal eigenvalue. Uh, of the transfer operator, but the function is going to be shoulder continuous. Yeah, so but is it explicit enough that you can actually get numerical estimates? Uh, explicit, what's explicit enough? I mean, this convergence that you get, it's on average, but on average. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, well you, it is so that, uh, well, uh, what we need from the convergence on average is that uh, the transfer operator has isolated maximal eigenvalue. And that if I take a positive function and I iterate it, uh, then I converge to where I want to converge to the eigenfunction. And uh, this is uh, this is sufficient, and this is what we have. I see. Nice, nice. Maybe if, if I could add but, some other thing. Yeah. I think this method maybe is, could be interesting. So one question that we didn't answer in our paper with Peter is, we we look at this parameter space of say octagons where you can yes. with when you always identify opposite sides yeah. and you can but it, and you can also but you can still modify the, the shape of the octagon and yes. so over all possible shapes it you know we we, we proved that the entry this this uh, uh, dimension is strictly less than one but still there would be good question where is the is where is the maximum there should be maximum one and maybe the maximum is the bolts of surface so that, that would be an interesting I mean, that, that I would be that kind of a, uh, maybe know. natural conjecture, but I don't know. In any case, I think it's a, it's a good question that goes into this direction. I know that uh, what's the surface thinking uh, minimize the lapon of exponent and the lapon of exponent is coming in the, in, in, in the denominator. So yeah, it's equivalent. Think... It will be equivalent to prove that it minimizes the lapon of exponent. I, so. uh, right. Yes, so I think uh, we can be reasonably certain that it minimizes the point surface is uh, minimizing the lapon of exponent. Yeah, no, that would be nice to, to make it precise. Yeah, that's nice. Any other questions? Was? I think, I, think, I, think, I think the question I want to ask, ask you should ask anyway. So, uh, No, Artem. We should be asking. <laughs> so, so, so one thing we might be asking uh, theoretically is about the computability or the or the, the efficient computability of these numbers. So let's say um, 
Well, since we're in a conference about Julia sets and I know best about Julia sets, let's take a rational, hyperbolic rational map. Then we know that the Julia set is polynomial time computable by this result of Braverman. Um, okay. So we could ask the same question about the house of dimension, right? So is, it, is, it, is, there, is there an algorithm that will compute this up to any given, um, up to any given um, precision um, in, in a time polynomial in the number of digits that you want? So if I understood correctly, so your method, so you get upper bounds and lower bounds, and in some of your examples, they agree very closely, so you get a lot of digits, and in some of them, you get fewer digits. So, so at the moment, you don't have a, so, so the issue with getting more digits is not just computing power, right? It, it's somehow you have to find the right functions for your upper and lower bounds, is that correct? Or, uh... That's right. Okay. So I, I'm having, uh, sometimes it is not very easy, to get uh, good uh, up functions. So the method that I displayed uh, for constructing the eigenfunction, it works very well when the eigenfunction is analytic. But uh, as far as I understand this idea, eigenfunction is not always analytic. And uh, this method in this case may not be optimal and you need to do something else. So, uh, that you need to find another way uh, to reconstruct this function. So this would be, you know, yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Mm -hmm. We have a nice uh, hyperbolic class of uh, maps. Uh, uh, do you think it would work? Uh... Yeah, if you have nice hyperbolic kind of maps, it should work. Okay. Well, it so slightly depends on your space. Where the maps, uh, where, where is the maps are nice, but I believe that um, we have now tools in hand uh, where this can be done. Uh, yeah. Any other quick questions? Yeah. Uh, positive uh, matrices lead to the dominated cocycle. Uh, do uh, are you able also to work in the case like? Bernoulli measures on the general uh, co-cycles, except for the uh, Furstenberg counterexamples. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question very well. Uh, uh, so you, but, uh, what? I mean, uh, the example for uh, random matrix products you gave was yeah. with positive uh, matrices. Yes. And the co-cycle generated by the positive matrices is dominated, so uh, yes. then it has hyperbolic behavior. Yes. But they, that, uh, can you work with elliptic cycle, but with, say, uh, Bernoulli measures on the elliptic cycle, so that uh, you have uh, Furstenberg theorem saying that you have non-zero Laplace exponent? Oh, I think so. I almost tried, but, I, but it, I think it's a very good question. I should, I, I don't know. I, I would like to know more about it. I have not tried yet, but this should be possible. Questions from online audience? Okay, let's uh, thank Paulina again. Thank you. And we will continue at 11.20. 11.20. Good day now. Quick announcement. Uh, we will have uh, a meeting for the photo in front of the palace at uh, 25 minutes past one. Thank you for a few seconds. <laughs>